Death is always with us. All of us are in very poor shape physically. It does not take much in the way of sickness to push us over the brink. There is always the thought that suppose you do get over a present bout of sickness, perhaps it is only to live for the next few days when you've contracted something else. Leonard Burchill, a young Canadian squadron leader in 1942, on his first reconnaissance mission out of the British base in Ceylon, now Sri Lanka, sighted a Japanese flotilla of warships and aircraft carriers, about the same size as the attack force that had decimated Pearl Harbor five months earlier. Before being shot down, he piloted his Catalina flying boat into the center of the Japanese force while radioing as much information as he could to his home base. He and four of his crew survived to be captured by the Japanese. From then until August 1945, he was the senior officer at four Allied POW camps in Japan. At each of these camps, Birchall instituted rules that no officer was to receive more food than any enlisted man, and that they were to intervene physically if necessary to prevent any abuse of Allied prisoners. These policies reduced the average death rate in these four camps to just 2% compared to 30% in other Japanese POW camps. I'm Scott Taylor, editor of Esprit de Corps magazine. I was taken hostage by insurgents in Iraq in 2004 and spent five days as a prisoner before being released. The very thought of spending three years and four months in such circumstances fills me with awe. I have long known of Leonard Burchill's story, but here it is in his own words, recorded in an interview with Richard Nielsen shortly before Burchill's death on September 10, 2004. Burchill kept a diary during his captivity, which he buried. It was dug up after the war and formed the basis for some war crime trials at which Birchill testified. In program one, Leonard Birchill described the defiance that led to a sit-down strike which got him transferred to a discipline camp. This camp was built on an island out in Tokyo Bay. The island had been made out of uh, dredged up sand and so on out of the harbor. And it was a little island about 50 feet off of the shore. And we were out on this island, and uh, on one end of the island was an anti-aircraft battery, and on the other end of the island was a, a searchlight battery, and, the, and the, the prisoners of war were right in the center between the two, uh, with nothing to identify them as prisoners. So it looked like a complete uh, Japanese uh, military installation. For the first... Uh, month, uh, I was uh, had to work all day long in a little uh, shack that they had for where the officers sewed bits of fur together to be put on the knapsacks of the, of the, say, of the troops, the army troops. And uh, we did that all day long. And then at night, I had to work all night long in the kitchen, getting the food ready for the working parties to go out the next day. And I wasn't supposed to get any sleep day or night. So I had to learn how to sleep uh, with little snaps here and there when the guards weren't watching and so on. And uh, the punishment for uh, if I got caught, which I did quite frequently, was you had to stand on these hot uh, stoves, the big, big stoves where they made the rice, cooked the rice, and bare feet. And with our berry berry, it was just terrible. And then you had to hang onto two great big pails of water to bring you, force your feet down on these hot stoves, and they would do this. And I did that for a month. And then they, then they, they let me off of that one. That was because they brought in some other prisoners who needed discipline more than uh, now I'd learned my lesson, supposedly. July 25th, 1945. We were allowed to write a letter home, and once again I write to my wife. It is difficult to visualize what's been going on back home, especially since I've not received any mail from my wife. I don't even know the address, since I'm certain she has moved since 1941. It will be like a return to life, going home again. As you can well imagine, I was not in very good favor from the Japanese point of view. And uh, so I was, we, we were allowed to write one card or uh, one letter or something like that. 
And they would tell me that I, I would write my letter and then they'd just tear it up in front of me and say, you know, you've not been a good boy and so you can't write a letter. So what I had to do was get hold of a, any of the prisoners who didn't have any connections and who didn't want to write letters or whatever. And I would write using their uh, name and uh, send it to one of my, not, not my family because of the family name, but I have to send it to one or, of a friend or something and uh, try to use some clue so they'd know it was from me. Uh, despite all that, it was uh, a year. Well, when I was in this Ofuni camp, again, one of the things that they told us, it's Japanese questioning camp, Navy, they said, now, if you're a good boy and answer all the questions and so on, uh, then you will go out, we'll let you go, and you go to the Army, and the Army, they're looking after us, and you'll be able to send telegrams and let your people know and so on. But while you're here, you're on the firing line, and nobody's to know you're here. So this one lad who was from Kiska, the little island of Kiska, when the Japs knocked that off, he was in the, in the same cell with me. And so we made a pact that whoever got out first would send word home that the other one was alive and well. He got out and went down to a camp in the south part called Zensuji, and he wrote a letter to his sister in Seattle, Washington. And uh, in it, he just said, Birchall of Canada is here. Uh, so she sent a telegram to Canada, just to Canada, and said, <laughs> Mrs. Birchall, the wife of the Japanese prisoner. And eventually, well, my first wife, uh, she, uh, her father was a colonel in the Canadian Army. And somehow or another, eventually, this telegram got to her. And she turned it over to her father, and of course, all uh, hell broke loose, because they'd had no word up to this point that I was even alive. And so they, then they got to work trying to find out if I was alive through the Red Cross, and the Red Cross had no word on it. And they eventually, they sent word to the Vatican, the Catholic priest who was in the our Canadian Army. He got word to the Vatican. I'm sitting in this camp in Tokyo, <laughs> Yokohama, and they tell me that the representative from the Vatican is going to visit us. Boy, I'm all prepped up to tell him just what's going on as far as our treatment is concerned. So they waltz in some great big slabs of beef and they get us and I thought, we're not going to get this, they're just going to have this here to show. And sure enough, this little Italian priest came in and he's just bubbling away and, and saying what a marvelous thing and how well we're being treated and I'm trying to tell him the truth. And finally, I can't tell, I just explode, and I called him everything that, that you can think of, you know. Said, you rat, you know, you're on their side, you're pro-Japanese guy, get out of here, sort of thing. So the word that came back, he said, yeah, he's alive and he's well. <laughs> April 4, 1945. 35 American B-29 bomber men are being held in a special compound. Tales of their treatment make one shudder. And I pray that if any of our lads are shot down, that they are dead before they reach the ground. What we did whenever there was a, a we, when a single B-29 came over very, very high, we know it was a photographic mission that was going on. We'd see the connecting the contrail. We'd all run out into the parade ground, and we formed the letters POW, unbeknownst to the Japanese, and we would all stand there and look up at this plane in the hopes that they would take a picture and uh, know that we were a prisoner of war rather than an army installation when they came in to bomb. I don't know whether they ever really knew about it, but the whole area, all around us was completely burnt out in the fire raids. It was just terrible what went on with those air raids, just terrible. Uh, we had to go out and uh, try to straighten things out and they gave us jobs to do. We had to cut fire lanes. The people themselves, they had no place to build underground shelters. 
So what they would do is they would take a small trench and take a basket work and they would uh, bamboo and they'd build this basket work over the top and then pile the earth over on top of that and it would just be enough room to get in to lie down in there. And they died and there was just all over the place these bodies and what we thought were uh, railway ties, they looked like railway ties, they were piles of, of dead bodies. They also, when the raids were going on, they took the uh, bodies and, the, uh, and, and threw them into the canals where people got into the canals because they thought that that was where they would be safe. And it wasn't. They had the water boiled and they were killed. And they all floated out into, uh, into the Tokyo Harbor. We had to have a 24-hour-a-day patrol of our prisoners to push the dead bodies off of our little island that we were on. It was just awful what went on with these areas. Since our island hadn't been hit, they thought the Americans knew, and I, I don't, I don't think they did, but they, they just uh, didn't, didn't bother with us. But they were just thick with uh, Japanese, right from our fence, right out to where they could stand in the water, <laughs> with their children strapped on their back and so on. It was just awful. They were just thick, uh, trying to, uh, to get away from these bombing raids. The sergeant who was in charge of the kitchen that uh, where I was working, he was not a bad guy. Very, very strict, uh, but fair, which was odd for a Japanese to be fair uh, for these guards. Anyway, they had a tower built so they could see all around the area. And this night, this great big fire raid came on. He was in there and he was up on the tower watching the fire raid and he yelled for tea, and so I had to run up the tower with this cup of tea for him. And he looked out at there, and he pointed out to the fire, and he said, uh, American airplanes, and I said, yes. And he said, you're a pilot, and I said, yes, I am. And he said, out there, my mother, father, wife, children are all there. And he said, they will be dead. And I said, yes, I'm sure they will be. So he then looked at me and he said, don't you do anything wrong. And I said, no, I sure won't do anything wrong. That is for certain. April 16th, 1945. Our water supply and electricity had failed and we had to bring in tubs of water from the mainland. I went on one of those details to see what I could. It was horrible. There was a solid stream of refugees from the south to the north along the main road. All these people carried their belongings in large handkerchiefs and a more pathetic sight I have never seen. They wandered along like dumb animals. In the majority of cases, they were blackened by the fire and about 80% had no shoes. Even little babies and children had terrible burns. These people stared at us with vacant looks as if they had lost their bearings and had given up in despair with trying to deal with the situation. I felt sick at heart and was glad when I got back to camp. They started trying to move out the prisoners because first of all, there was no place for them to work or very little place for them to work except cleaning up the mess in Tokyo. Uh, secondly, they were running very short of food. They had no food. Their ball, their rice supplies were being burnt out and so on in the Tokyo area. Our camp, we had no water. They, the water had been, uh, had been coming across on a little bridge uh, from the mainland. That had all gone. Uh, the water had been turned off, so we were having to go over to the shore and get buckets to bring the water out across. And we ended up with about 250-odd uh, people, and they packed us into trains, into uh, just box cars and just jammed. Uh, there wasn't even room for you to sit down. And you were just standing there and we had uh, dysentery and diarrhea 
and they wouldn't open the doors. We had no food. We were there for 48 hours while they pushed us around until finally we ended up way in the mountains. And that's when they let us out of these boxcars. And that's when I found out once again that I was a senior bloody officer in the place. And that's when they took us up into this open face mine up in the mountains that we were. That's where we were when the war finished. It was a real death camp. We got in there in the first week, three guys died. It was just awful. August 4th, 1945. One of the men named Howard had lost nine kilograms. He fainted at work and also passed out on the march home. This was reported to the Japanese and he was made to stand to attention until after supper. He was not allowed his evening meal or his breakfast the following day. He also got a bad shot of food poisoning, which I blame on the water. Our only water supply came down off of the, uh, the mountainside, off of coming down through these terraced rice paddies. And they fertilized the rice paddies with human excretia. And so all the water that we had, we had to take it and boil it and try to get it as clean as we could to drink it. That was the only water we had. Uh, so we had to go out and cut down a tree every day and chop it up in order to get for our fire. Uh, we had open pits for sanitation, and the lads had to walk down one side of the mountain across the valley and up the other side. We had no shoes, and it was all rough stone. Feet, the problem, the feet just swollen, and it was just terrible what went on. That was in the summer of 45, and we had a doctor there an American doctor, and uh, both he and I, we estimated that if any, just if one person was alive by the end, if we went through that winter of 45 into 46, we were gonna be lucky. We didn't think anybody would exist. The death rate just and the sick rate just went right through the roof. July 31st, 1945. We had another day of weighing all prisoners. Our first record of weighing was taken 10 days after we arrived. Our last record shows that 71 men have lost three kilograms, 46 men three to four kilograms, 12 men four to five kilograms, eight men five to six kilograms, one man eight to nine kilograms, and one man over nine kilograms. The camp average is over three kilograms down. So we got stealing teams going. We uh, uh, false nail defense. We had uh, four stealing teams. These were the guys who had the best health and the most reliable that we could get in our camp. We had an officer go with each one of the teams. Two would go out to do the stealing and uh, one would stay on, the, and then the third one would stay on the outside of the fence and the fourth one would stay on the inside of the fence to operate the boards and make sure of the guards and all that sort of thing. While they, and we rotated as to who went out. We went into the vegetable fields, potatoes. They did, grew a lot of potatoes. The guys would go in and dig down, take the potatoes out from underneath the, the plants and bring them back in. We just threw everything into the, into the mash them up and put them into the stew. And then we found, they, they told us that we, we got one third rice, one third millet, seed and one-third soybeans. They said they had no soybeans. And so instead of giving us more, they, our, our ration was cut really by one-third. So we only got two-thirds of our, of our ration. And then we found the building where they had all these soybeans stored. So we hit that and we started taking the ones from the center of the pile and and uh, it was all hollow. We knew someday they were gonna find out about this, and when they did, God help us. But the war ended before they found out. Out of the blue came four American fighters. It was the most beautiful sight, and it threw the Japanese into a complete panic. One guard dropped his rifle and jumped into an air raid shelter. The morale of the camp was raised 100%. When the 
raids started down in Tokyo, Yokohama area, and they started to burn the place right flat. We knew that, uh, or we thought that there was going to be an invasion, either that or the Japanese are going to give up. Um, the uh, Japanese military, of course, they were really adamant about the fact that we're never going to give up. And we had to uh, dig um, trenches in the Tokyo, Yokohama area. We had to dig a trench in each of our prisoner war camps. In some places in the Yokohama area where they have a, a yama, a small mountain, they, uh, they dug a cave. And then they had cans of gasoline and machine guns. And the prisoners were going to be marched either into those trenches or into the cave, doused with gasoline, set on fire, and uh, then if anybody tried to escape, they shot them with the machine guns. Um, and we knew this. They were going to kill all the prisoners. They were going to kill all the people who were, who were uh, uh, a detriment or a in which the, the non-productive person. They wanted everybody to fight to the last man, the last bullet, not have anything to deter them in this deal. So we knew this. As they started all that thing, we knew then that things were, they were gonna be invaded, that the war was going to finish. Whether we were gonna be killed or not, or whether we were gonna survive or not, we didn't know. In fact, I, from my point of view, I, I never thought we'd ever get through it, that, 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 we, would, uh, that we would live through the invasion on the place. When we got up into this camp in Sua, in the mountain place, there was an interpreter that we had. He was a Hawaiian-born Nisei, second-generation Jap, and he was a young lad, and he had come back to Japan prior to the war uh, on the basis that they uh, gave scholarships and so on to these promising young students, university students, to come back to Japan, finish their education there, their university education, but also to learn some Japanese. And then once they got there, they confiscated their passport and they couldn't get an exit visa, and so they were there when the war broke out, and they were using them, uh, their knowledge and technique and everything else. And this chap had been our interpreter in this camp. Uh, but he, I, whether he saw the writing on the wall or not, I don't know, but he was very pro-prisoner uh, to the extent that they fired him. But this fellow was in the same area, and it was then he was the one that came to us and said that there'd been a bomb gone off. This terrible thing had happened. They didn't know what it was, but it was a, a terrible bomb. And that the emperor came on the air and, 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 and uh, said the war was over, surrender. But he said, the, the army are not going to get out. They're not going to quit. And so you'd better head for the hills. Uh, we couldn't move. Uh, we were so sick and there was nothing we could do. August 15th, 1945. Fukumoto was very excited and got me to one side. He said that the war was over at noon today. It was an unconditional surrender and camp headquarters was only waiting for orders as to what to do with us. We got started at once organizing the men into nationalities and lining up NCOs to take over. If this isn't true, it's enough to turn a man to drink. And so we had a little conference and I said, well, what we'll do is I'll go over to that uh, commandant and uh, try to reason with them about the end of the war. And uh, if I can't reason with them, if, they, if, if you see that I'm going to be hung or shot or whatever, then you can try and let's hope that somebody will get out and, and, and get back. Uh, let's just hope and then they can tell what happened. But if I can, I'll try to talk him into us taking over the camp. So I went over, this was in the middle of the night, and I went over to the uh, commandant's office. We knew where he was, his little quarters. And uh, we had our own guards to make sure the Japanese guards weren't around, and I managed to zip over into his place. And he was in bed, and he was pretty drunk on sake. I guess he realized, well, he knew that the war was over, and so I picked up his sword. Now, the sword is a very uh, 
it's emblematic thing that's very it holds a very important place in the Japanese life. Their sword, their honor, and everything else is in that sword. So I picked up the sword and uh, woke him up and said the. Um, uh, it was in the scabbard. I didn't threaten him or anything with it. I just said the, the war is over. And he nodded his head. Yes, the war was over. And I said, Well, now we're going to uh, we're going to run the camp. And he said, Yes, fine. So I said, We now need the guns to protect ourselves. And uh, so he said, Yes. So we got up and we went out to the guard house. And he was he was leading the way. And he got the guards all assembled and and said, Give us the guns. And I took the guns and gave them to our own troops. And uh, we weren't going to hurt anybody. And they weren't going to hurt anybody. And that was it. August 19th, 1945, there was a terrific uproar, handshaking, laughing, and a wild show of emotions. Our rations tonight were the largest here to date. The funny part of all of this is that I can feel no relief, but instead an intense feeling of responsibility. The only time I shall fear relief is when I can hand the command of these men over to responsible people. Between us and Tokyo, Yokohama, were an awful lot of very irate army and, and civilians who'd lost people uh, and in the bombing and fire raids. He said, look, uh, let's do this. What I want you to do is we'll stay here until we can get ourselves in the best physical shape we can get, and then all of us, the works, and I'll guarantee that everybody Everybody gets there, the whole works. We're not going to leave anybody behind. We're not going to do anything. Everybody goes or nobody. August 29th, 1945. Shortly after lunch came the drone of an aircraft and we rushed out. It was a formation of eight machines. I was so excited I could not even count the various types, but there were fighters, dive bombers, and torpedo machines. They roared over the camp and then started dropping things. One sack of sugar went right through the roof of our barracks and our sack of clothing through the Japanese barracks. All the articles dropped were distributed before supper, even down to the parachutes for souvenirs. So we took over the camp uh, and we painted big POW on the roof of the, of the camp. We got some flag poles, we put those up, big bamboo poles. We made uh, flags out of, with crayons and uh, sheets, old sheets, beds, pieces of sheet, I hung those up there. We bought horse, a cow, a pig. Uh, we scavenged all the food we could find in the whole area and all the medicines we either bartered or we just took it. And, uh, until we, and the uh, doctors and the kitchen staff worked day and night until the uh, doctor said we're about as good as we're ever going to get. Uh, and we got now we got to get out of here. And that was when we organized our coming on out. September fourth, nineteen forty-five. The CO came in about 8.30 p.m. with the official announcement of our going home tomorrow night. The train leaves at 0017 hours, September 6th. We uh, got all the trucks that we could find and we loaded everybody on the trucks. Down we went to the railway station. Train came in. We took over as many coaches as we needed for everybody to get on board. We came out overnight. We got into Tokyo the next morning. We then waited and confiscated all the transportation we could find at the railways, Tokyo railway station and got people on there, moved over to the Yokohama line, got on the train there, confiscated her, took over the troop, or the king got down to Yokohama, got out of there, got onto the uh, outside the station, flew our little flags, and again, no time flat. A jeep came by with a big aerial on it. The guy got off, said, who the hell are you? And we told him who we were. 
of what the story was in the no time where they had ambulances and trucks and buses and God knows what and nurses and what have you. They picked us all up and took us down to the go down on the at the harbor. September 6, 1945. All the fight had gone out of me, and just the big feeling of relief made me feel, what the hell? I'd been going for well over 48 hours without any sleep or rest at all, getting us all out of there. And uh, when we got out of there, I was just gone. And they uh, stripped us all down. We threw all our clothes into a big fire. Uh, and uh, we, uh, they gave us, <laughs> shaved us all, every hair off of our body, put us through a, a sheep dip, I guess, to get all, kill all the lice and bugs and God knows what on us. And then after that, we had these hot showers of uh, nice soap, which we'd never had, and hot water. And then stark naked, they waltzed us through a whole bunch of nurses and doctors, and there they, they did the quick uh, sort out, you know, this one's bad, this is real bad, this one's all right, and this they did. And then when we got through that, they then waltzed us through, and you could pick up as much clothing as you wanted, shirts and pants and underwear and socks and boots and stuff, and you had all this. And then they, in the meantime, all this was going on, the Red Cross girls were running around with big boxes of chocolate bars and cigarettes and God knows what. And then when we got all finished with that, they brought in a, a, one of the prosecution team or whatever, and I gave them all my diaries. And I said, well, there's some still here. And they, we got a Jeep and we went down into, around Yokohama. We managed to locate most of the diaries, dug them up and I gave them to the uh, people. And uh, then they took me from there uh, to Manila, and again, whatever bits and pieces, whatever I had left, I gave to the prosecution team there, because I didn't want to even see it again. And then they, uh, based on all that, they asked me to go back on the war crimes, which I did. I was then put onto a hospital ship, the Marigold, and I don't even remember going on board, but I do remember once I got on board that I was given a nice clean pajamas and a bed and uh, all of myself. And I was, now I had nobody to look after but me. This seems like a very happy ending, but the Cold War was just beginning and Japan was a potentially important buffer against the Soviet Union. MacArthur, who was very tough on Japanese war criminals in the Philippines, now wanted to win the hearts of the people of post-war Japan. To that end, he found war crime trials counterproductive. Still, many of the Allies were determined to make the worst offenders pay for their crimes, in particular those who practiced their brutality against Allied prisoners. No one was in a better position to give such testimony than Leonard Burchill, who had not only been subjected to it, witnessed it, and tried to prevent it, he had also written it all down at the time it happened. He was the perfect witness for the prosecution, or was he? When I first went over and, and when we were last circling Japan to land, we circled over the top of Omori coming into an Eda airport. And I looked down and there was that island where I had been on the discipline camp. And I had an awful time. Uh, was I coming back there for revenge? Or was I coming back there for justice? And I had an awful time convincing myself that what I was really there for was for justice. And if they could, uh, if the laws and so on and uh, their culture permitted what they were doing and they really, to their mind, had not stepped out of line, um, then, uh, all right, we would have to go along with that, but not revenge. And I had great difficulty in maintaining that approach, but I, I think that I, or I hope that I did maintain it all the time I was there. After just one trial, Burchill was sent home on MacArthur's orders. He'd been too good a witness. There was one redeeming moment. The soldier that Burchill had prevented from attacking a sick prisoner pleaded that he had already suffered enough, 
since on that occasion, Burchill had broken his jaw. But seeing justice betrayed was not the only cross the ex-POWs had to bear. The extent of their suffering was hard to grasp by those who had never endured anything like it, and its long-term mental and physical effects were not known. It was, after all, without precedent. You must remember that they, when we came home, there was no such thing in those days as post-traumatic stress, none of that. Uh, we came home and you got no treatment, nothing, no consideration. You had horrendous nightmares, we still do, bad feet and so on. Addiction took over. Guys came home who's uh, to find that their wives were remarried, new families. Their homes had been sold, they had nothing. Their businesses had gone. We got no compensation, they got nothing. We tried desperately, or were trying desperately to get compensation from the Japanese government and we had no support. In fact, we had every roadblock in the world by our own government put in, in front of us. It wasn't until we suddenly found that they had been hiding, that the Canadian government and the British government had been hiding the fact that there was a loophole clause in the surrender deal about being paid compensation, that if this was justified, that it could be paid. It wasn't until we found that out and then we hit them again that the Canadian government said, all right, we will now give you the, uh, give you the compensation. It should have come from the Japanese, not the Canadian government. Why should the Canadian taxpayer pay this when it was the Japanese that started the war? They created all this. No way. So it's still, although we got the compensation, far too little, far too late, uh, still it should not have come from the Canadian taxpayer. It should have come from the Japanese who, for who, were, who were responsible for all this. Everybody looks at me and says, you know, you're very vindictive and what have you, why don't you forgive, forget and forgive? Uh, first of all, the Japanese have never ever said they did anything wrong. So what am I forgiving them for? Something they never did? There's nothing in their textbooks. They don't teach anything in their schools about what happened. They've never lived up to, to what, what was done. They've never done this. So as far as they're concerned, they're completely blameless. They've done nothing wrong. So what am I forgiving them for? There's nothing they've done wrong. Uh, forgetting, I don't think there's a, if you go to a, all you have to do is go to a Hong Kong veterans reunion to see what shape those guys are in. Uh, you've read this book, Hell on Earth. Uh, it says, uh, dying faster and sooner. Uh, more of them. They've, they've gone through hell. Uh, there's still all these nightmares. Uh, I still have ter terrible hot feet from my beriberi. Never get over this. Blindness, the people that went blind from lack of vitamin A. Um, People who, because of the gangrene and so on that set in, have lost hands and so on and feet. Can we forget that? You can't forget that. Uh, no one will ever be able to erase it. As much as you would want to forget, you can't forget. So to say to me, forget and forgive, it's impossible. I, I, I don't see them, I, I don't see any remorse um, or, or any even thought of, uh, you know, of concentration. The odd, odd exception. Occasionally you will see a write-up somewhere by uh, a Japanese saying, you know, that we did wrong, I think. But it's on the back page along with the comic section and the crossword puzzle.
when I saw Hiroshima, and I stayed there three, four days with the Japanese family that had been there when the bomb went off. They had been, but they were been up in the background somewhere off the field where they, they didn't get hit. And they took me around and showed me what had gone on. We went to the hospitals where the uh, survivors were. You've never seen anything like it in your life. Just horrible what was what those people, the survivors who had been hit with atomic radiation and so on. Went to one place that was a great big flat field. And I thought, oh, well, this must have been a playground or something. And I said to them, you know, was this a playground and so on? And they said, no, 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 no. This is a great big high story building. And I said, well, what happened? It's gone. It's gone. Nothing. And I went through this thing and the, the mutilation and the thing. I just said to myself, and after seeing all the bombing out, the terrible going through the bombing out of, of, of Yokohama, Tokyo, came back, went through Germany, Frankfurt, Hamburg, on my way coming home, back through London. And I just said that war has got to be stopped. We just, it, it, it doesn't make any sense. We've got to, war's got to be ruled out. Leonard Burchill's courage was matched by his compassion. Indeed, in his long sustained resistance to Japanese brutality, it was his compassion that had fueled his courage. In the darkest days of the war, all Allied prisoners in Japan took courage from his example. Few of them were Canadian, so most of what has been published about Birchill was written by American, Australian, and British prisoners. Here is what U.S. Navy Lieutenant Commander and fellow POW James R. Davis wrote about Birchill. In circumstances where too many officers had failed to live up to their responsibilities, the tales of Birchill's leadership carried throughout the system of camps brought renewed faith and strength to many hundreds of men. It is incredible how morale of disheartened men can rise behind the example of a courageous officer. Birchill came to be something of a symbol, to stand in the hearts of men as a true officer. James R. Davis. In 1967, Lester Pearson related to Birchill a conversation he'd had with Winston Churchill, which Birchill later asked Pearson to put into writing. Pearson wrote, The conversation took place at a dinner at the British Embassy in Washington. Someone asked Churchill what he felt was the most dangerous and distressing moment of the war. Churchill said, The one that caused him the greatest alarm was when he received word that the Japanese fleet was heading for Ceylon and the naval base there. The capture of Ceylon and the consequent control of the Indian Ocean and the possibility of a German conquest of Egypt would have closed the ring and the future would have been black. However, Churchill went on to say, we were saved from disaster by an airman on reconnaissance who spotted the Japanese fleet and though shot down, was able to get the message through to Ceylon, which allowed the defense forces there to get ready for the approaching assault. Otherwise, they would have been taken completely by surprise. Sir Winston went on to say, this unknown airman who lay deep in the waters of the Indian Ocean made one of the most important single contributions in the victory. He got quite emotional about it. I broke in to tell him that the unknown airman was not lying deep in the Indian Ocean, but was an officer in the Royal Canadian Air Force. Mr. Churchill was surprised and delighted to hear that the end of the story was happier than he had envisaged. With deepest regards, L.B. Pearson. Good night.